want to thank Will and everyone for coming. And uh, so I'd like to be useful. Uh, I, I'm always amazed that people show up to talks like this. Uh, because we usually go to talks on such generic subjects uh, to have our own prejudice confirmed. Um, and uh, we are, the chance of my persuading anyone here of something he or she doesn't already believe is practically non existent. The more educated the audience, the less flexible. <laughs> so, uh, very different if you're coming to lecture and you have a new piece of information, but uh, I don't have any new information at all. Uh, I've only unvarnished opinion. And, uh, so I, I want to I want to first say that I'd like to be useful, so I'll I will say a few brief things about um, the subject, and then uh, we'll open the floor to a uh, to conversation. Uh, the the other thing I, I, I do want to say is that I, I want to apologize ahead of time if I offend anyone. Uh, I, I'm not applying for a job. And the chance of my returning to the University of Virginia is so small that uh, if I can speak plainly here, there's no reason to come all this distance. Uh, I'm not running for office so of any kind. Um, so I apologize ahead of time. I, I have no intention to, uh, to offend. Uh, but I'm taking better in it. <laughs> The other thing is that um, I, I know very little about the local circumstances. That is to say, I know what half attentive readers of the New York Times know. And since I trained not to believe it or to think there's more to it, since anything I know something about the New York Times is invariably wrong, <laughs> I, don't, I don't think it's useful to have a opinion about something I know nothing about. And so uh, I do understand, and it would be hard not to understand, that these issues pertain to the University of Virginia, the question of the future of the university. And, and it is, uh, but it's for you, members of this community, to figure that out. That's nothing I can contribute to. It's not an act of cowardice, it's simply an act of ignorance. Uh, and uh, so, the first issue I want to raise is one that is in the public conversation, and that is the presence or threat of technology. So my position on this is pretty simple. Technology has now emerged. It's still in a very early stage. As an instrument of university learning, as it is being formulated, if you look at Coursera, Dasty, is an altogether good thing. The big mistake is for people to be against it. First of all, no one really knows what it is. And um, there's no reason from a historical vantage point to be anxious about it. I'll we'll cover that in a moment. What these online courses are doing is putting out of business bad teaching or non-teaching, which the universities not the University of Virginia, perhaps, but the large university in the United States has been guilty of for decades. So we are responsible for any destructive competition technology has brought our way, because we have lived with a kind of not totally candid acceptance of the large lecture course in organic chemistry designed to flunk most of the people out and to engender not a whit of interest in its subject. <laughs> to leave the teaching of undergraduates to graduate students, whose work therein has no reward to their professional career and their training, provides no status. This is horrific in the sciences, where the assumption is that if you need teaching, you shouldn't be in the field. Also to say. And um, I was shocked 
uh, in one of our prestigious universities where I have to be visiting. I came early and there was a lecture course on Shakespeare. And a very famous person was lecturing. I snuck in to catch the last 10 minutes. There are 1,400 people in the room. When the lecture was over, the undergraduates clapped. So I said, it's not a performance. At which point, a few, few, five, very hardy, ambitious, probably obnoxious undergraduates, <laughs> scrambled to the front of the auditorium in an effort to ask a question of said lecturer. At which point, a cordon of teaching assistants rose <laughs> out of the sea to block the access of the five unwitting undergraduates who seeking to ask the question. One of them broke through the Cardinal Sanitaire, not to the faculty member, and she said, talk to my assistants. That will be put out of business, and it should be. So, we are to blame for the so-called threat of technology. Technology actually is a huge asset, because it allows us to abandon these nonsensical courses and actually begin to do some serious teaching with undergraduates. So the university must, must pay attention to the technology and utilize it. In a word, my view about technology relationship to university life is in, in terms of teaching and learning, is technology is a net good. It's a neutral factor. One cannot make it a causal factor. So it has to be analogous to the role of the elevator in the history of architecture. It's an important factor. It's not transformative. It makes it bigger buildings, taller buildings. It's an important thing. But technology, technology centered theory of change, historical change, has never been persuasive to me. The other analogy is technology. I've said this often because it keeps people awake. And the role of technology to learning is the same as the role of technology to sex. It's enhancing, useful, amusing, diversifying, but at the end of the day, it's not replacement. <laughs> So there's nothing to fear, only something to gain. <coughs> Second, the important thing to realize is that, in my view, the university should not be in the business of fighting demands that be useful. Not to set up fields of study as useless in some given sense of the conversation. There is no reason to appeal to something that does not actually exist. People who study for its own sake. I've never met anybody who did, who was remotely honest. And it's not necessary. <coughs> The truth is that everything we teach can, and theoretically, and actually, can be defended as useful. Absolutely useful. The question is how do you locate that utility? So to put us in opposition of the study of classics, the study of classics, a very good example, is the use of classical literature in helping veterans returning from the wars come to grips with the reintegration in civilian society. And one of the great foundations of wisdom and understanding are the classical texts that describe warriors returning home who've been abandoned, can't reintegrate their families, can't connect with them. So these classical texts hold veterans, many of whom have never been to college, in tremendous engagement. It's not a violation of the sanctity of those classical texts. The second thing we need to do is to stop in the humanities and the social sciences imitating the natural sciences. 
let's forget about achieving comparable standing on the same terms. <coughs> the purpose of teaching music in the university is not to produce more musicians. The purpose of teaching English in the university or literature is not to produce necessarily more writers or teachers of literature. Perhaps it is to educate more readers, more amateurs, more listeners. Why do we have to measure ourselves by the number of graduate students, the number of majors? Why do we have to professionalize our disciplines in a way that gives us a sense that we have a status comparable to that that physicists or biologists claim to have? Many of the fields in the university have their primary purpose as service, not as ends in themselves. Too much of the teaching we do in the university derives from our own professionally centered conversation. The allegiance of most people in an American university is not to the university, but to the profession that transcends the boundaries of the university or the institution. And careers are made within those professional rubrics. It's not clear to me at all that undergraduates will respond to that conversation or talking about the subject. The most egregious case may be in the case of literature. Teaching a young person that reading is not stripping the page for the plot, stopping the reading reader in his or her tracks in an early stage to figure out possibilities of meaning, to discover that Lolita is not about inappropriate sex, any more than it's about America, maybe. But what it would might be about requires really careful stopping to read, rereading, going back, thinking about meanings of words, of the use of language. Those things can be taught without letting the person think <clears throat> that they are inadequate or commanding a language which is counterintuitive, a theoretical language that is counterintuitive, that to use it or not user-friendly. So we need to think about what we do in ways that are completely different, in my view, uh, than the way some natural sciences think of themselves. Now, the truth is, in the natural sciences, there's a tremendous amount of ferment as well. And the boundaries between disciplines are themselves also not as rigid uh, as they once were. And in fact, some of what we call multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary teaching is actually now coming to, um, to home to roost in the sciences as well. Here's one of the things about the science undergraduate teaching is you cannot simply delay the contact with research till after you take inorganic, organic, and then physical chemistry and finally get to a chemical problem. That the, that the achievement of requirements in a sequential way, segmenting chemistry from biology, segmenting mathematics from biology, that no longer is necessarily the case. It might be as an integrated approach to the teaching of science, that's problem-based, is what's actually going on. There's a very innovative program at Princeton, precisely on this basis, which replaces the segmented, self-interested, often hazing sequences created by existing academic disciplines that no longer conform to the problems that that discipline indeed is dealing with all on itself. What a modern biologist needs to know today is different from what a biologist needs to know 30 years ago. The same is true of the music historian. So we have a lot of reform work in our own work to do before we mount the battlements in defense of university in its current form. But be honest about ourselves. Very important point, we have to have an honest conversation. The university is not an efficient institution. 
The university is by definition inefficient. If you want a great university, you have to put up with wasted, so-called wasted time, unproductivity, seemingly leisure, which is really just anxiety of people who tell their colleagues they're doing something when they don't. <laughs> the book that never came out, the long project that they're still dreaming of. The university is a un place of unpredictability and inefficiency. No one can say ahead of time which faculty member, which graduate student, even which undergraduate student, will make breakthrough work or create work that's memorable. And not simply imitatively in a journeyman or journey person style. Not that that work is bad. Even a field where there's not a new idea has to be kept alive by imitation, has to tread water. Because fields don't always have the same vitality because the way fields are form is through the way people frame questions, and the historical context of those framing of questions shifts. There's a revival now, after many years of less interest in, for example, medieval period. And there are many reasons why that may be the case. So the fact is that an efficient and inefficient <coughs> institution is one in which uh, one has to positively resist the argument of rationalization. The university is an irrational place, a messy place, it needs to be defended as that. Now, it seems implausible in the current political context of the United States. Well, it's implausible because we have fallen down a very important job. And this campus, is what I will say about the University of Virginia, has been confirmed by my hosts. We have been satisfied to let the public forge its primary allegiance and even the students to the professional sports function of the university. Highest paid employee of this university, I guess, is a coach. And the thing that the citizens know most about this campus are its teams. Duke University, great university, is known for basketball, and scandal. <laughs> it's an insult to the people who work there and live there. And we have permitted this. We've conspired with it. We accepted, I think, fraudulent arguments that it's economically productive. We've allowed the American University to be a farm team for professional sports. <coughs> we haven't defended the university by its contributions culture, and the science, even the economy. There's an extremely apocryphal, and famous apocryphal story of a president of a major state university in the Midwest who apparently said to, to a legislative hearing, don't you want a university in which the football team can be proud? <laughs> <laughs> so this is something we've lived with, and the small colleges suffer the same disease. We are unwilling to face, in an American democratic egalitarian context, the public with the virtues of the university, which seem inherently discriminatory, elitist, exclusive, judgmental. And we hide behind the mask of their populist appeal as instruments of sports. By that token, we also actually are complicit with all the problems in governance university. The failure to have serious leadership in the American university that intersects with cultural and political issues. I cannot name a single university president in, in office today who could possibly approach the moral and political stature of James Bryan Conant, of Theodore Hesburgh. But you made sure, <coughs> both of your faculty members here, made sure that no such person would ever be appointed. The constituents don't want leadership. 
You like your own authority. You like the absence of centralized leadership. You want paper pushers. You do not want people telling you what you should do. You love your anarchic independence. In this context, anybody who wants to be a university administrator should be disqualified by definition. <laughs> <laughs> the reason Shirley Tillman was retiring from Princeton was a fine, great university president, it had never occurred to her to be one. Bartramani the same, accidental choice, not a professional choice. So we have to decide that actually we might actually need real leadership. We need also to be very honest about the issue of the economics of Europe. Because we don't have proper leadership, and because we are in bad faith with our obligations to teach, <coughs> to actually use the intellectual content of the university as its main self-definition and the most inspiring aspect of undergraduate life, what's memorable to most Americans out of their undergraduate life is not what they learned in class. It's everything but what they learned in class. Except maybe for the very narrow pre-professional training. I got to the law school, I got to medical school, my first job. So in that context, it's very hard for us to defend the cost. We're actually not doing the job. But if you really wanted to defend the cost, you have to say the issue in the United States is not a matter of the cost of higher education. It's the financing. With the exception of the coach, nobody here who is employed by the University of Virginia is overpaid. Given the level of achievement, the level of training, the salary scales in the university are modest. I think they're okay, so I think the lawyers are overpaid. The bankers are overpaid, but not university faculty. Not even university administrators. And since the overwhelming, the overwhelming share of the university's budget is labor, employment, and there's no profit being made, the argument for the university is too expensive. It's only too expensive because the United States, states, and federal government are unwilling actually to subsidize the cost of being a student. Tuitions are high enough because they are inefficiently run or too expensive to operate. Tuitions are too high because there's no subsidy for those tuitions. It's not a priority of the public, either in state budget or in the federal budget. It's our insecurity that makes us powerless, in my view, to make the proper argument against the issue of cost. It's not necessary to segment the cost of the university by dividing it among the people who attend. Not necessarily that's the way to think about it. That there should be some tuition probably makes sense, the Europeans increasing in that direction. And perhaps there's some truth to its necessity, especially in America, because people have so little respect for anything that's free. <laughs> so having to pay for it, kind of the old-fashioned Freudian view that a patient has to put some of their own hard-earned money into it, that's probably reasonable. But it's much too high. Not too high because the University of Virginia is inefficient. Too high because the priorities in the nation are not willing to provide the resources which we could amply have to subsidize. Imagine there is a very popular film, I don't know if it's popular here, on Lincoln. <laughs> this film is about the Emancipation Proclamation, as you know. But Lincoln's greatest achievement was mostly land grant. The creation of the state universities. If they could do it in the 1860s, if you can 
damn well do it now. I think in the um, in the humanities and social sciences, we talk about the liberal arts. I think the key to our successful place in the university has to be in the way we construct and develop undergraduate curriculum. The current system, in my view, is dead, and the, the advent of technology only makes it more obvious. If all it is is taking an interchangeable course in English literature in the 19th century, you don't have to go to the University of Virginia. I can buy a good Coursera course that's well done by someone who seems to know what she's talking about on the very same subject. <clears throat> the real advantage comes from the physical reality of the university and the nominal community of scholars, which actually doesn't really exist. The people in the university don't actually talk to one another beyond the level of gossip. And the creation of a curriculum which leads the student through a really well thought out rite of passage, intellectual rite of passage, which helps them define who they are, what career they will take, to consider what they do or do not believe and why, to have a real conversation that makes a difference to their conduct of life. That curriculum does not exist. That curriculum is not an amalgamation of courses put out of a course book, which really is the result of the narcissistic intentions of various departments, of assigning people things they think are important for them to teach in their conversation with each other, not with the undergraduates. There's no consideration of the need to know. Why should we, anyone be interested in Dickens? or in Tolstoy, or in Mozart, or Raphael? It's a very good question. I can answer the question. There's not one answer to the question. There are many answers to the question. But a curriculum should be designed around that question. How do I make it relevant to an undergrad? So I'll give you an example. In a, in a well-designed curriculum, the material is chosen not because of its political representation, but because of its pedagogical power. So many uh, curricula that are designed in this way stumble on using the Essays of Montaigne. And one of the reasons the Essays of Montaigne are used is because they are so remarkable in touching on issues in <coughs> commonsensical ways in very sophisticated why people wear clothes. Notice I was teaching the essay on friendship. I chose the essay on friendship for the undergraduates. They have to write a paper in imitation of the essay. Because with the advent of Facebook, there are more friends in the world than have ever existed. <laughs> <laughs> so a serious critique of what means friendship and the use of that language is counterintuitive. And without the intellectual tradition, they would never have been motivated to think, wait a minute, what's, what do I mean by this word? How do I differentiate it from other relations to human beings? How do I construct? Is the notion of an idealized relationship with someone that has no advantage or self-interest, is that even a possible thing? Maybe that's an ironic suggestion of something that really doesn't exist. <coughs> suddenly begin to think differently. When a student coming out of high school in the United States reads The Republic and looks at the divided line and discovers that somebody really thinks the experience of sight is a secondary form of truth, a big light turns on about the origins of metaphysics which is also located in the use of language, the daily use of language, and begins to think counterintuitively about things that they actually have accepted without fault. The brightest undergraduates come to us with a pastiche of linguistic habits borrowed 
from the environment thoughtlessly. We have the tool to actually enable them to think about basic issues in ways which they feel capable of doing. The last time American higher education really worried about this was a very long time ago. First during the First World War, when Columbia University decided that when Americans were going to go to die in France, they should know something about what they're dying for. And they put in, as a result of the American entrance in the First World War, the first attempt at the Common Core in Columbia. Hutchins, Stringfellow Barr, and Scott Buchanan, in Chicago and in St. John's, put in the great books in the context where they were worried in the wake of the Great Depression, of the powers of fascism, the right, and communism on the left, and defend the traditions of democracy. We are in such a historical crisis about the nature of America, our place in the world, about the structure of society, the nature of work, the longevity, notions of fairness. We have all the material to begin a serious conversation that's internal to an individual and that is useful in what is left of democracy. Of where I come from, people are not fond of owning guns. And neither am I. But I find distasteful the liberal inability to understand why, in fact, people would defend the Second Amendment and why they believe the right to bear arms, even an automatic weapon, is something that could be made sense of. I have no use for it, but I understand that for the average citizen, including myself, we say we live in a democracy, but in reality, I'm irrelevant. I actually am totally powerless, and I have no real voice. Who's got the voice? Maybe the very rich? Maybe a Hollywood star? And the inner circle of the present? Where do I actually feel that I have some existential memorability. My car and my gun. Mm -hmm. There is my source of freedom and my threat, my potential of actualizing the fact that I'm not completely insignificant. So the popularity of this is a symptom of a larger ill in the way we conduct democracy. When people say, well, the Swiss, their issue of automatic weapons as well as the military service, well, I don't idealize the Swiss. But Orson Welles saying the third man who invented the Kuku Club. <laughs> a little bit more than that. But nonetheless, they still have town meetings. They have more of a vestige of, of direct democracy than we do. So the gun is not the only reminder that they exist in the eyes of society. The ability to think empathetically about someone who is not identical to yourself. The revival of religion in American society. For those of us concerned about the kind of religion that is revived, the problems of what goes by the word fundamentalism in all the great religious traditions, it's impossible to get young people to think critically, as far as I had a duke, about faith in a way that was not violating of that faith without close reading of great theological texts. Without reading, without reading Augustine, without reading Calvin, without reading Luther or Aquinas, the Christian tradition. Young people come to us eager to be helped even if they feign disinterest and boredom. And everything we have to teach them in so-called liberal arts 
is intensely useful. Fifteen years ago, we were asked to set up a liberal arts college inside the leading university of Russia, St. Petersburg State University, which is the Harvard University of Virginia of the Russian Federation. And we have such a college with 500 Russians getting a liberal arts education. <coughs> Eagerly sought after, hard to get into. <coughs> Why did the Russian government support this? They believed that what we were teaching, close reading, a coherent curriculum, extensive attention to writing, to analysis, to debate, cross-disciplinary, was a key to economic and scientific innovation. They blame their backwardness in the competitive world of modern economy, not to the problems in their scientific establishment, but to their educational system. The public is prepared to hear that argument. But in order to make that argument, we actually have curriculum that make a difference. And for that to happen, in fact, they have to get together and agree, not on conclusions, but on questions, problems, materials, skills, a variety of things. And the solution is not to imitate St. John's or Chicago. That would be a terrible mistake. It's not about canons, about great books, great this. But it's about a coherent, process of serious education and self-education. If we end up serving people who become graduates of a business school, school of commerce, or an engineering school, great. I would love to see lawyers trained in this way. I'd love to see physicians who actually have been tempered by a close encounter with humanistic pursuits. So before we rise in offended defense, we have to make the case for ourselves. And that case can only be made with the undergraduates, Manner of teaching and the manner of curriculum. So, in a way, we have to you know, defend ourselves from, from ourselves and each other. And I think actually the incidents, insofar as I understand them at all, that occurred here last year are an early warning sign. Unless we get into the debate and control it, the debate will continue to unravel to our disfavor. This will be mild. Will be easily categorized as irrelevant and useless. Will be pushed out in the allocation of resources. Will be easily, quote, replaced all those fears. And so the only thing to do, I think, is to realize the danger and to collaborate within the context of a given institution and rethink the path that we offer. So when someone comes to the University of Virginia, they come to the University of Virginia having some idea of the distinctive intellectual journey that they will go through. Not a journey of ideology, but always an implicit ideology. Let me close the most obvious plea that um, <coughs> the amount of time in the undergraduate life between majoring and non-majoring has to be rethought. Faculties fight over a very little bit of the time that's a lot of general education. And they hog for institutional reasons, resources, numbers of faculty, to majoring in the number of people who are signed up in their enclave. 
those budgetary structures have to be changed. The incentives have to be turned around. And there's to be real credit given for teaching what once was called a service dimension. At the end of the day, uh, in my view, um, <coughs> You know, one of the reasons I'm not nostalgic about the university of the past is because I have to deal with alumni. <laughs> <laughs> when somebody starts to tell me how great it was 30 years ago, I might seem to invite them to a reunion to see what little residue there was. So we need actually I'm always amazed, you know, when we've complained as a nation about the quality of our political discourse. The ads, the, you know, the, what's happened in the last 10 years to the inability to have a real debate. You know, we, all, we all know there's no presidential debate. There's a presidential singing contest. <laughs> One person sings, the other person sings. <laughs> <laughs> teach it are all PhDs from name brand universities. They even publish. <laughs> the dean of one of them is a historian and published a book on prohibition in Manhattan called <coughs> So, 
that's my peroration, my sermon. I thank you for hearing me out. And if there are questions, I'm happy to comment. And so 
that she looks at you with contem withering contempt because she can't begin to explain to you what you don't know about your own body. So then she says, to you, well, you know, it's sort of like this. You see, your esophagus is like the sink. <laughs> and, um, and we got to sort of, um, you know, make all the water go through. <laughs> so what I'm prescribing is the moral equivalent of Drano. <laughs> now, the truth is, as the, as the patients scramble on the internet to get information, 90% of them don't understand what they're reading. And can't distinguish the right from the wrong. So, we are totally at fault in the failure to do real undergraduate education. And the humanities could be useful, because the issues of biology intersect with those of ethics, economics, so all kinds of issues, the environment, energy, no end of subject matter. I excluded them in this conversation simply as a matter of efficiency, because the, you know, in, in the line of fire, the classics and literature are the first, you know, they're within range. You know? <laughs> so, so you've got to figure out something to do, you know, for them. But you're totally, totally right, and I apologize if I can do that, because it's actually a combination. If you really put, sit, sat down and did something different from what Hutchins did and, and Rodrigo Bar, one of the basic things is you would actually integrate the sciences into the issues. Um, uh, and so, um, it's very full of art, it's about the kind of professors here. Did you know that? What would you like to say, John? Oh, good for them. Hard to believe that their curriculum has so been so ossified that they were once considered the way Scott Green was kind of utopian socialist, and they ended up being the darling of the neoconservative movement. It's one of the odd things about when curricula become rigid and ossified, which has uh, become authoritative. Curricula are just instrumentalities, they shouldn't be in a shrine forever. They have a, they have a half life. Yeah. Uh, it was a really stimulating talk. Thank you so much. Um, I have a question about a possible tension that I perceived and two things you were saying. So you mentioned memorability of experiences for undergraduates in the <coughs> curriculum. Um, but you're also talking about their formation during this process, right? And it seemed to me that it would give rise to maybe two different types of curricula. There's one that's a little more eclectic, that would emphasize the memorability and, and kind of the extraordinariness of some of the topics they deal with and the the questions they encounter, like, what is friendship, right? And then the notion of, ed of edification or formation would be much more continuous and perhaps not so memorable, but at the end of it, they are a different sort of reader. But they couldn't say at which point they became different in that way. So do you have, do you have a notion of combining those two, or would you choose one or the other? Yeah, from a, if I understand the question correctly, from a, from a, um, uh, a structural point of view, um, the way we work, I think curricula have to be a mixture of things. So one would be things that would normally are identified as common core, shared courses, where there would be varieties. Then you don't need a course book as large as you have now. You would have then uh, kind of a, a medium elective arena. And then you would have, um, as the students become more specialized, obviously, um, you're not going to break that down. You have to have some kind of way of looking at those specialized courses, not merely the province of one department, but more problem-oriented. So I'll give you an example, um, as we discussed in an earlier meeting. So in the study of literature, one of the very attractive rubrics is to um, have something in the issue of translation. Because then you're appealing to the primary language of the reader. And then you open up a whole wide variety, crossing boundaries of language and time. <coughs> the whole issue of one language related to another. Um, and um, uh, in, in some cases, the problems of, um, of so the, as a student becomes even specialized, the rubric in which he or she becomes specialized may not cohere with the graduate department or your organization. That's one thing that I think is part of the political problem. The allocation of resources and the, and the intellectual problem uh, of organizing. But the other thing, which maybe is not what you had in mind, but comes to mind in your question, is 
there's the other issue of the parallelism between the social life and the academic life. So one of the reasons people live in dormitories, right? Your students live largely, they're not commuting. They are commuting students, but you house a large number of your students. They're not, they're not mm -hmm. Okay. So you have this claim. The only symbol of it, of course, again, this would come back is to the Greek system. Now, I don't want to say much about the Greek system because it doesn't merit a lot of noble conversation. <laughs> but it's reflective of the reality that we've never had a curriculum that has influenced the way people voluntarily define fun. <laughs> now, one of the tragedies of those of us in the humanities, I once, when I was very much younger, I was um, uh, rehearsing a college chorus in a program uh, that um, had um, some of the shorter choral pieces by Hans Brown. And uh, one called Nenny. And it was written uh, as a memorial piece to a friend of his, the painter Anselm von Feuerbach. Anselm Feuerbach, who did the, the wall paintings in the Academy of Art in Vienna. And died very young and was a kind of unsuccessful rival of Hans Machart, the great historical painter of Vienna of the 1860s and 70s. And um, <coughs> it's an extremely beautiful piece. He was. <coughs> His mother survived, and Brahms wrote in part um, an appreciation as a, almost a gift, a personal gift to his mother, to Anselm Farmer's mother. And in the rehearsal, and you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not politically correct, so I'm in with the rehearsal and I said, you won't believe me, but this is much better than sex. Much better. And certainly, not even the same league, sex is least competitive. But certainly a lot better than being drunk. Now, of course, I start to laugh. But the point I want to make is that we are in the business. Now, this is the character building aspect, which nobody wants to talk about at the university. Is we're in the business of helping people redefine through the virtue of an education what they consider fun. What's having a good time? The idea of the Jekyll and Hyde experience of our most selective universities. They work hard, they get the good grades, and then they play hard, and the two have no connection. Is our field. The idea that what we're teaching is obligatory castor oil for survival in a gated community. <laughs> And we don't pay, we don't, it's their fault. They're Philistines. They're going to have that last laugh. <laughs> I actually love the material I deal with. I would prefer to spend time with it. And not because I'm a wacky nerd. But I learned that a human being, I can have pleasures denied the dog. <laughs> and that's what we're going for. <laughs> so, so it seems to me that that's commonsensical, you know. Uh, and and um, and there are ways of doing it. Technology is very, very helpful. The social network is very helpful because the first time we have the means actually to break the conversation up in a normal university classroom between teacher and student to student to student in a fantastic way. Fantastic way. You know, when you tell a class that the papers are going to be submitted, are going to be put online for everybody to read, and they realize, oh my god, they're not just bamboozing the professor is one thing, but <laughs> my girlfriend's going to read this, you know, and now suddenly, suddenly it gets significant. Simple as that. So we need a curriculum that influences the conduct of extramural life. And you have it easier because 
you have a self-styled sense of your own importance. <laughs> You're an elite institution. What does that mean? More binge drinking? More vulgarity in the name of But we turn our backs. We, university faculty, turn our backs. We pull the curtain down on our the administrative problem. That's how the whole infrastructure of student life administrators came to be in the university. The pseudo professional official babysitters. <laughs> Frankly, the British, you know, whom Americans still adore for no apparent reason. <laughs> I was amazed. The Washington Post had an article about the, the portrait of Kate Middleton. And I said, why are Americans concerned with brainless, useless royalty against which we rebel? What's the fascination? <laughs> Why is it that William and Mary thought nothing better than their anniversary to invite Prince Charles to speak, who has nothing to say and couldn't find it if he thought about it? <laughs> <laughs> the fact is, the Oxford Dons and the Cambridge Dons, that we so idealized, did care about. You follow me? They did. But the professionalization that we've gone through has made this basic, undignified, could possibly. There are some places where it still does happen, but it's 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 rare. Yeah. I wanted to go back to the question of usefulness. You yeah. said you didn't mind the idea that we ought to be useful. It's to be useful. Yes. And you contrasted that with the thought that study is its own end or something we should do for its own sake. And I don't think anybody thinks that. But some people think understanding is something that's good to have for its own sake. And that seems like a more realistic view to me. So, you know, for its own sake argument. Yeah, understanding. I mean, and the sort of just coming back to before, you know, uh, what, what, what happens to them in that theater, right? When, they're confronted with a great tragedy that speaks to them. Well, they understand their circumstances better. And that That's also, useful. But, you know, but then, okay, if, if usefulness includes that, say, you know, deepened understanding for its own sake, then what's left to contrast it with? Yeah, but you, it feels to me like you know, the, the champions of usefulness are opposing something, uh, and, and the, the proponents of usefulness are, are, are uh, urging us to affirm something that, that marks a real debate. Okay. I, I think I okay, I where you and I differ is that there are two there one because you're a philosopher, I loathe and I'm not. So I'm an amateur, so I don't you know, I I concede ahead of time. So one is <laughs> Tremendous love for self-help. 
right? We think mental health, which we define as without anxiety, which seems to be like living death, from what I can tell. <laughs> so, um, but somebody thinks that's good, right? So I, I, I was Andrew Solomon wrote a book about depression, a very interesting book about depression, and um, for some reason it, 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 it caught up. And we were talking about how we treat, you know, um, deviancy in children and uh, certain kind of behavior. And I was saying that that um, the current medical practice would have medicated Beethoven, he would have ended up as a postal clerk. <laughs> uh, so, but. Our, our notion is of happiness a kind of very deracinated definition of happiness. So that's useful. So if you're telling me, I would defend that as useful. So this soldier finally understands, A, he's not alone, B, this is a time of moral problem, that people have survived it, the different ways of trying to do it, and maybe there's no exit from one of the issues that not happen. And that's useful, it's a recognition, some recognition that it's not, there's a situation is, is that. Now, in our debate, where you're probably right, is <coughs> I think before we come to agreement that there is a fundamental difference between two sides, I want to press the definition of this because I think that most of the people who attack us don't act, need to know that we are far more useful than they give us credit for. That the teaching of classics and the English literature and all this is actually not frivolous decoration. I, I, I want to suggest that, um, that um, and I make a very bizarre argument, for example, about music, which is my own view. I think music is absolutely important because it's self-evidently useless. It's self-evidently artificial. So it's actually one of the few means you have of reminding people of their sacred existence. Because their relation to it is never identical. So if you take four children, and each of them play the same piece. The sameness is always distorted in a way that's quite unusual. And it's in, in, so there is something about musical activity, which I would argue is, is called spiritually redemptive, but it's useful. Precisely because it's useless. It's completely hard, you know what I mean? And you're, I'm turning it around. So I'm trying to stretch the definition, but certainly from the point of view of the critics, the legislators, people, the high-tech people, I think we, we've given up too quickly, we've jumped to the other side too quickly. I think there's a tremendous argument we made to the people, and in fact, when you talk to them, they, they actually buy it. Believe it or not, all the investment banks, um, in the old days certainly, were, were prejudiced in behalf of the arts graduates, uh, and um, uh, law students, law, law um, to get into the law, having I mean, classes was viewed as an advantage. So there is a tremendous amount of, um, of, of, of stretching of this word. Now, you raise the question of sciences. They're getting away wholly because most of the great scientists produce work, not because they think it's useful, but they want to solve a problem. And they love to solve a problem. I'm, paying, I'm taking the emotional connection the act of doing it as useful. That's the other thing. I'm cheating. Mm -hmm. I'm cheating. I'm saying useful. So, for example, theoretical mathematicians or biologists who are interested really in cell function or fundamental genetic function, yes, maybe it has something to do with some biotech company, you know, 10 years later. But if you look at the generation of all bio, bio, biologists who invented, who discovered from Watson, and the second the generation right after, not a single one of them, a glorious generation, ever thought there was any money to be made in this. Now, one of them thought this was the case. They were amazed. I mean, they liked the money, the ones that were still alive. But the fact is, they didn't go into it with that in mind. And they didn't do the work. It occurred to them. They were motivated by the same, what you would call, love of the, of the chase, of the, of the act of writing. But that's what I mean, the act of discovery. Um, and the idea that you could teach someone that the act of reading is enjoyable, the smile that comes on your face when you read something, not because of the information it imparts. And that's a tremendously useful 
because my concern is is the the residual social pressures of boredom, of ennui, of real boredom, the most dangerous social among educated, privileged people, and that is what we really face. And your brother can tell you that the basic scientists are under the same sort of pressure. Yeah, totally. That uh, exactly. they're being driven out by the patient advocates, by the people who are interested in the money flow. He blew my cover. I have an older brother who's a very good scientist, and so um, <laughs> and we were very close. We went to high school together. Oh, we can do that. Good for you. So, um, so he's, uh, he, he, my other one was started out this first generation of biologists. And, but what's interesting is that the that a tremendous pressure in the science funding for practical. But they can they can wrap it. In other words, they're smart. They say if you want to cure asthma, you gotta learn this first. And the people in the legislature don't know what they're talking about to begin with. So, you know, but the great thing about taste is everybody's democratic. Look look at the whole issue of, of classical music, right? We're never gonna get national funding for high art because uh, I don't have the advantage that the scientists have. Because the congressman likes what he likes. <laughs> no? When the Netanyahu government put in a new chairman of the board of the orchestra, a music director, who told me that his favorite piece of music was the Rachmaninoff second piano. And um, I was in deep trouble. <laughs> I had no way to convince him that, what, that there was other music to be listened to. He, you know, for him that was hard. And uh, a wonderful piece, but you know, it, 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 so um, people are very deferential. You know, this is the whole thing also about, about um, you know, in those periods of time, thank God that's over now. When we had the culture wars, you know, about, about um, you know, uh, the implicit oppressed by ideology, but, you know, somehow that, um, that in the areas of science, people um, were more, more apt to concede the universal validity of claims. You know, they didn't get onto an airplane and said, this is Western technology. I won't take it. <laughs> Not really. So there was always an advantage that that they that they had, and they have it now in the political discourse because it's connected to the economy. But for example, no one, no politician, I fault our politicians, has ever actually told the honest story of the Manhattan Project. The Manhattan Project would have been impossible. All the achievement, however you look at it. <coughs> of making the bomb and ending the war to take that position for a very limited time to take was done only because of the power of, 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 of non utilitarian science. Yeah. Could you expand a little on the notion of change within the university, particularly looking at the vertical structure <coughs> of the university? From faculty to president, there are many steps in between, yeah. and in the process. So I, look, I, my, I, I'm chairman of the board of one university, which is much smaller, a graduate university in Europe. Uh, it's a private university, uh, Central European University. Uh, my, the rest of my experience is really limited to much smaller institutions. So I know it only secondhand from observation. So my, my. My general feeling is that the situation is, is um, hopelessly set up to militate against change. So the, 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 the habits of institutional momentum, which is a form of inertia, are viewed as normative when they shouldn't be normative. That's what's happening. So how do you change that because of the vertical organization? Number one, the faculty are structured to be divided against themselves. They will only unify in extremists about things that threaten them collectively in some way and briefly, and never about the substance of what we do. So it's very, very hard to count on collective faculty action. And the interests are splintered. 
Uh, and the administration and the lay governing boards are um, meant to have the, the support system. So like, every institution is a little bit different. In many institutions, it's a tripart alliance against strong centralized leadership. So you have centralized bureaucracy, but you don't have centralized leadership. Now, how do you change that? I, I, I don't know. Um, I would not hazard a guess. I do think the way to change, first of all, the curriculum has to be done by the faculty. It has to come from, in a way, from below. But it can be led and supported <coughs> from higher authorities. Um, the truth is, we don't uh, appoint um, university presidents to be intellectual leaders. They're, they're managed, <coughs> understandably, it's a big business, a very complex one, with a huge amount of regulation. So it's not amateur work. You have to really know how to, how to do it. It's not, not easy. Um, but I wouldn't. I wouldn't know. Um, I wouldn't have. I do think that I think that the kind of popular front, because of the severity of the crisis, even you say it's disappearing, it, it has, and people know it's it's you know they the ice has been broken. People know that there's a problem out there. So even though the short term may have resolved itself, the long term everybody's aware of it. No, people can go on. No, people forget about. It. But it's a huge opportunity. You have a huge opportunity. Because of the crisis, it's a tremendous advantage. In a way, um, the last thing I'll say, they, in a way, the, uh, uh, you know, they, your board of visitors did you an enormous favor. <laughs> put you on the map. <laughs> so seize the day and make something of it. So please, uh, do seize the day, come to the reception just outside, and please thank the President of Pakistan.